Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to my channel again. Um, I just thought of an idea of something to talk about, a topic. So again, I just came on to, to discuss thoughts off the top of my head. So who knows where this conversation might lead and might not lead. Um, and so I, I just hope that you enjoy this. Uh, so I want to do something more spiritual, maybe later in the day today. Um, but for now, I wanted to talk about... Um, something more, because I, I do enjoy talking about ideology and politics and stuff, um, and looking at it, you know, through, through the Christian lens. So, um, I really want this one to be a message of grace to people who disagree with me, people who are on the left, but, uh, you know, it does discuss some hard things, and so, I, I don't know how I'm going to do that without making it, like, controversial, right? Um, so the, the question at hand is, like, Nazism and what's happening today in the parallels. Uh, so being a conservative and a Christian, I have multiple times been, like, labeled a racist or a Nazi. Um, and I'm not doing that to say, like, what was me. Uh, you know, it's, it never is fun to be labeled those things, obviously. But I, you know, I kind of, like, accepted that that's kind of what happens when people don't really understand those terms. So, so uh, I, I read this book, and this this actually was something that really helped me to understand ideology. And it's really... A controversial book um but to kind of understand the the ideological patterns that have come emerged in the 20th century and how they're kind of reproducing into the modern fashion um so but like the problem with this is that it's it's not it's saying that actually conservatives and christians are not nazis at all um but like the other ideology is much closer to Nazism than we are. And so that's like really hard for people to hear who are on the left. Um, so the, this is the book, it's called The Big Lie, Exposing the Nazi Roots of the American Left. So if that's you like who are on the left, you know, just recognize that you're not a Nazi, right? That's, that was a different time, a different era. But uh, that book does discuss how the patterns of ideology really fell in line with what's going on today. Um, and he also, like, the book has not been debunked. And uh, everything he said in the book, he, he's, like, challenged people to refute the things he said. Um, so he's discussing facts. Uh, but it does also talk about fascism, the rise of fascism in Italy and how that is also similar to what's happening today, because now you have Antifa, which on the cover of the book, actually, I don't know if you saw that, there's a picture of, you know, a riot, Antifa, and this wasn't the 2020 riots, because this book was written before that. Uh, these were the riots when Donald Trump became president, uh, and uh, basically riots poured out onto the streets because he was the fascist dictator, right? And so... <clears throat> so Antifa is f fighting fascism, right? Um, but basically, like, one of the most striking uh, instances of gaslighting is that title, Antifa, as though they're fighting anti-fascist, uh, you know, they're fighting fa fascism. And what they determine as fascism is anything that disagrees with them. Um, conservative ideals, uh, basically people who disagree with the modern left. And so what they do oftentimes on college campuses is when people will um, go to speak, people like Ben Shapiro, people like Dinesh D'Souza will go to speak, they will create movements and uprisings to force them out. They will um, sometimes, Jordan Peterson is another one, they'll sometimes like enter into these people's rooms where they're speaking and they will start shouting them down they'll start chanting their slogans they'll hold up signs they'll and then as you saw in that photo you know there's gas bombs and stuff they throw they throw tear gas they 
um, do all sorts of things. And then, of course, if you remember at all the riots of 2020 after George Floyd, basically the Antifa and Black Lives Matter were able to hijack, you know, a, a instance of injustice in order to basically like wreak havoc for, I don't even know, like six months or something. Uh, every day they were rioting, especially I think Portland was the longest lasting. I don't know if it was the most destructive of all the riots, but it was the longest lasting. It stretched for months. And every night these uh, these bums would pour out onto the street and they would, they would go up and they would deface private property. They would uh, loot businesses. They would um, throw, you know, throw uh, Molotov cocktails and all sorts of garbage, right? Um, throw bricks at police officers. Uh, you know, because they basically, basically the narrative is that when one police officer acts unjustly or one conservative says something stupid or... Uh, it, it translates into everybody. So, so I can't remember the officer's name, but the guy who kneeled on George Floyd's neck, uh, oh, Derek Chauvin, when he kneeled on George Floyd's neck, that was in effect an action taken by all of police officers all around the world. It was all of them. And moreover, if you think there's anything fishy about the ACAB, which is all cops are B-A-S-T-A-R-Ds, um, all, you know, capitalism, if, if you agree with any of these things, you are a part of that oppressive system. And so this ties in with the decolacization, right, uh, that I was talking about, the intellectual decolacization, because I don't want to tie people to, like, the decolacers who were, like, actually committing murder, who were doing evil things. That's why I called it the intellectual decolacization because, and I think it is not without merit to, to title it that. So this all feeds into that system because these movements, as we've discussed, are driven by Marxism. Um, they're driven by uh, theories that emerge from Marxism. Ways to see the, which is basically like what I'm trying to say is ways to see the world um, and structure people and integrate people based on their group identities, their victim status, um, which you see identity politics pouring into that, or their lack of victim status. So all of those things are kind of, like I talked about before, working as a vessel for these people um, to, to, to do this damage and to label any, anybody who disagrees with them as the oppressor to, uh, you know, to in effect make the, the unjust action of one police officer uh, and extrapolate that to every single police officer who is in the police force and then make demands, like absurd demands that would, would actually really harm minority communities. Absurd demands such as like abolish the police force and they're still demanding abolition of the police force. Like if you were to abolish the police force in Chicago um, there would just be skyrocketing crime or in, or in Detroit or in any of these places. And that's what we saw happen was when, when the, the Antifa and the Black Lives Matter started decrying the police, when they started decrying um, the, you know, the Western capitalist system and, and force like, like complaining that police officers all across the board were all B words and they all needed to leave then the these cities actually started bowing down to their demands not completely but a lot of them started i think it was new york cut like a billion dollars from their police force and we saw we saw pretty much in all of these cities a skyrocketing crime rise um we saw you know we saw the opposite happen so we saw these and and that's the other thing about blm is that they don't really support all black lives they only jump in and talk about police brutality when that happens, but they're not the least bit concerned of like the the huge amount of crimes in minority neighborhoods that that happens every day, right? Um, so they're not concerned with those things. They and so that that's another problem with what they're doing there. So I wanted to do a full video on BLM, but this one I kind of wanted to do on ideology. 
And what I'm getting to is basically that these entities, um, and there were a lot of people in those protests and riots who weren't there for those reasons. They weren't there. Um, they kind of got swept into this wave, right? And so, um, and maybe even some people who did violence were like, were not, this is going to be controversial, but some of those people who did violence were really actually upset at what happened to George Floyd and, and thought that was right. But what what many of those people in those riots di were doing were causing destruction because they just saw it as an opportunity to, to express um, chaos and to be anarchists. Uh, they didn't really actually care about George Floyd. They don't care about anybody. So you could argue that these, these like, I, I would, I would say college leftists who, um, who learn all this garbage in college and then they like pour out onto the streets when they see like a, a, a black person murdered at the hands of police or a Hispanic person murdered at the hands of police and they're like, oh, here's our opportunity. And then they go out and they start, you know, shining lasers at police officers' eyes and blinding them and they start throwing bricks through windows and, and uh, targeting actually black business business owners um, and causing all this destruction. And it's like, aren't that, isn't that racist to like hijack something that might have actually been racism in order to cause more damage and in effect like harm the black community perhaps for like generations because these riots that are happening in these like lots of times low-income cities are going to affect the economies of those cities and and this uh crime rates of those cities for a long time like maybe decades we don't know uh the effect the long-lasting effects that all this destruction could have um so anyways uh but what i was trying to get to was that these people are not anti-fascist they're actually fascist because they don't want freedom of speech they don't want people to express different ideas they don't want any dissent from their ideology and they are basically acting in exa in an exact same way as the re as the uh black shirts and brown shirts so the black shirts were from the um, from the fascists in Italy and the brown shirts were from the Nazis. And these two paramilitary groups, kind of like the KKK, which was the old de democratic paramilitary wing, but these paramilitary groups were, were like the, the vessel on the back of which the regime um, was able to come to power. And now after this huge movement and all this uh, societal intimidation that, that the public put the public under, but also the media put everyone under, uh, and the Democratic Party put everyone under. The Democratic Party was able to come in, and now it's still, like, trying to manipulate uh, the, the, the masses through all the tools that it has, and it has an incredible amount of power. It has all the powers of the state at its disposal, pretty much, and it's able to manipulate people's minds and hearts and turn them... Uh, into, you know, just mouthpieces for the party. So, and that's what we see because we see like every time, you know, Dr. Fauci or Joe Biden says, hey, we should start wearing masks again. The people just say, oh, look what they said. We should wear masks again. And then they start wearing masks again. But not only do they like, cause that's fine. If you want to wear a mask, that's great. I'm all for it. But not only do they want to wear masks, they will slander anybody who, who says, you know, I'm not going to wear a mask. Sorry. They, they will say that you are wanting to kill grandma. You are um, a super spreader, not only a disease super spreader, but a misinformation super spreader. Um, so you're, you're two kinds of super spreader. And actually, like, you know, sometimes saying, well, hey, you just want to kill a bunch of people. So you're almost like akin to a mass murderer. Um, and so... These, these tactics, like this huge umbrella that, that kind of lumps everybody into these groups of like really vague oppressors that you can kind of be anybody you disagree with at any time, that's a tactic that was used in the dequalization. That was a tactic that the Nazis used. They, they, they would kind of like point their fingers at anybody who, you know, who stood in their way as being dangerous and 
And at first they would, you know, they would kind of intimidate them ideologically. They would mess with them and, and, and kind of like, like what they did with the Christian church in Nazi Germany, like here, just integrate this paragraph into your theology and we'll be good. Right. But that was not enough. It's never enough. They, they want to push more and more and more until eventually it's all out persecution, not just of Christians, but of anybody who, who, uh, rejects the party in power. And, and so like, it's different, right? It's not the exact same as the Nazis, but you got to remember the Nazis were socialists. They were um, operating, their modus operandi started with Marxism, although they disagreed with the communists. They were, their, their ideology came from Marxism. It was, they were the National Socialist Party of Germany. They were also eugenicists. So they agreed with using eugenics and playing God and and uh, hurting people, like and uh, like hurting people in both senses of the word, right? H, H E R D, H U R T. So they would hurt people, and they would, you know, they would gas uh, people with disabilities. They would gas uh, the Jews. They would because they wanted to bring about this like new world order, right? With this this new race of human beings that were superior than the old race of human beings. And they they were going to be the instrument. Hitler was the was the spearhead, and he was going to be the instrument that brought about this this new era of peace, guys. But don't you understand? There has to be war before there's peace. There has to be struggle and conflict before there is survival. So they were operating under a survival of the fittest paradigm, um, where people who disagreed with them were were essentially. A, a, a disease to humanity and like a cancer that was growing in humanity that had to be operated on and taken out. And we see that kind of intellectually happening here in America with the intellectual decoolacization where people who have ideas that are different, people who are Christians and don't buy into what the state is selling, uh, don't who don't want to wear masks anymore. We, we wore masks for a year and a half and we're done. We don't want to wear them anymore. We're vaccinated now or whatever. Even if you're not vaccinated, you shouldn't be forced to wear something on your face. Those people are a danger to society and those ideas are dangerous. So don't you see Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and YouTube? They have to like flag what you're saying. So right now it's just, it's, it's just flagging, you know, they're not yet maybe taking down your posts. They're not yet maybe limiting and reducing your reach. Um, but they do have to do this for the common good, you guys. Don't you see? Like, we want to move together. We want to move forward into a more peaceful and prosperous era and age. Uh, but in order for that to happen, there has to be um, a filtering of the, the people who disagree with us. We have to filter them out. Uh, they, we have to take those ideas and just kind of extract them out of their minds um, and then throw them in the garbage so we can move forward. And, and I think that it's going to become pretty apparent soon. I've talked about this in other videos that that is going to become Christianity because, you know, Nebuchadnezzar built that idol and he said, bow down to it now. And, uh, the prophets were like, no, we're not going to bow down to it. Uh, and Christians are going, you know, some Christians are on the side of this, but I, I think that more and more are going to wake up and be like, Hey, no, we're not going along with this. Uh, sorry, our God is higher then the state, then, then your edicts that tell us that we can't have freedom of speech. Even the highest laws of our nation are higher than those edicts. So, you know what, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna go with the, what the founding fathers said. We're gonna go with what even obviously way more, infinitely more important than that, what God said in his word, when he commanded us to tell the truth, we're gonna go with those things and we're gonna reject what you're saying. Um, Maybe we voted for you, whatever. Uh, but yeah, now, sorry, we're, we're not going along with this anymore. We're not going along with this narrative. And um, so anyways, these, these ideological similarities between the 20th century regimes um, and what's happening right now and, and the, the controlling of people and, and masses and, and the controlling of the public mind and... Uh, what is becoming more and more in vogue is 
th these similarities are popping off the page in my in my mind. Um, these similarities are when you, when you read what Hitler's religion was, when you read um, what was going on in the dequalization, uh, when you read the Gulag Archipelago. Obviously, those those were put those regimes were pushed to much more dangerous extremes. But of course, you could argue with the abortion industry that we are there now, right? Um, so as far as eugenics are concerned, so yeah, we're, we should stand up against this, um, Christians and non-Christians, and we should just recognize like, hey, and, and it took me a while to recognize these things, but recognize, hey, like these similarities are real and I'm not gonna go along with this anymore, so. Um, so that's not a message of condemnation for anybody who disagrees with me, but it's a message of hope because, uh, you can, you can still hold on to, uh, liberal beliefs, right? Uh, and, but some of the things that they pushed is that they've, they've used the liberal platform to manipulate and to, to turn it into a, a lust for power, um, and a greed for controlling people's hearts and minds. And that's what's happening. And now what you see is that even in conversations with people, you're not really allowed to talk about things that cross over a certain line. And that line is so vague and arbitrary. You never know when you're going to cross that line. Um, you can be saying, hey, guys, and and you're talking to, you know, people who are men and women, which I do that all the time. I don't, I don't mean like men are more important, but it just, you know, and, and I actually do want to work on that, but like, Hey everybody, but Hey guys. Uh, and people can get really mad because you gendered the group. You assumed a gender for the group. Um, so there's and all sorts of politically correct thought policing, which is a huge part of it, um, which is re resulting in the cancellation of people. This person's canceled. That person's canceled. Dr. Seuss is canceled for um, drawing a cartoon of an Asian person. And uh, but meanwhile, Cardi B is not canceled. She 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 made a pornography for eighth graders, and she is a champion of women's rights. She is um, she is fighting for racial justice, right? Uh, so that's that's just how backwards this stuff has all gotten. Um, these people who who force vulgarity and force Marxism and force this this demonic thought control onto the population, they're being upheld and lionized by the culture as being these these superheroes, right? Whereas people who just speak speak the truth, people who um, who make a off color joke, are demonized as outliers and canceled and that's the intellectual decolorization so anyways I'm, i hope this video was helpful and if you enjoyed it please like share subscribe and uh have a great day thank you bye